get started, kick things off. Be respectful for everyone's time, uh, especially our special guest. For those of you who aren't as uh, well-versed in all things Zoom, you can do speaker view. When Sarah starts talking, you can wait till I finish because you don't necessarily need to meet, see me in big screen. But once Sarah starts presenting, um, it'll be nice to see sort of uh, your full screen with her and her presentation. Um, after she's finished, we'll have time for some Q&A. So uh, feel free to put them in the chat or just hold on to them and we'll get to them um, at the end of the presentation. I was exposed to Sarah um, thanks to Gresham Smith. And I know we have a lot of friends on here from Gresham Smith and they invited us to attend the Black Landscape Architect uh, Networks Conference for February. They had a speaker series for Black History Month and had a lot of really incredible, great presenters talking about all sorts of um, different topics as it related to Black history or different intersections. And um, Sarah was incredibly impressive. I think she was maybe the first one that I heard. And so as soon as I heard it at texted a couple friends and I said, we have to get her for our speaker series. She's amazing. Um, so we tracked her down and despite some technical difficulties <laughs> with our internet system, um, we were able to bring her uh, to join you all um, this evening. So I'm gonna read her bio because it's very impressive. Um, Sarah is the founding principal of Studio uh, Zudi and she is uh, based in New York City, also teaches at um, Harvard. She was just teaching right before this. She's an assistant professor of practice at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. She has received a number of awards, including the Hebert Award for Contribution to the Development of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, and the Silber Silberberg Memorial Award for Urban Design. She was named the 2014 National Olmsted Scholar by the Landscape Architecture Foundation, a 2016 artist in residence at the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, and in 2018 was named to the National Trust for Historic Preservation's inaugural 40 under 40 list. Most recently, she was named a 2020 United States Artist Fellow. She's a registered landscape architect. She holds a master's of landscape architecture from the Harvard University Graduate School of Design, a master's of city planning from MIT, and a BA in Sociology and Statistics from Boston University. So um, incredibly well-versed in all things landscape architecture and has some really interesting um, things to share with us this evening about Olmsted and how that uh, comes into play with landscape architecture and some of the work that she's seen. So. Um, I want to thank Gresham Smith for the intro, and I want to also thank Republic Bank for sponsoring this series this evening and um, the ones we've had previously. So thanks to you all for being here this evening, and without further ado, Sarah Zodi. Thank you, Layla. Thank, thank you all for joining on a weekday evening and, um, and inviting me to, to share a little bit of my work and my thoughts. And thank you all for the work that, that you do to steward these parks and spaces. Um, I've never been to Louisville, but my mother went to college in Kentucky. And so I have been to Kentucky because she drove me there so I could see her college campus. She went to, um, I guess when she was there, it was called Cumberland College, but now it's the University of the Cumberland. Um, but so I'll just, just a random side note because all things Kentucky she loves, I will say. Um, and I'll share my screen. Full screen. Okay. Can you but can you all see my screen? Okay. All right. Um a little bit about me, I grew up in Louisiana um, and I was in college when Hurricane Katrina happened and I, I watched the storm from my college dorm room. And um, it was really, I really didn't know what I was gonna do in college. And when, so when Katrina happened, it really propelled me to figure it out. And um, I, I really went on a search of what I wanted to do. What could it be? 
what disciplinary framework would allow me to engage in the cultural and the aesthetic and the ecological and the infrastructure and the political, just all of the, these different factors that I felt were related, they, they, they came together to manifest this event and its aftermath. So long story short, it ended up being landscape architecture for me. Um, and so, well, you know, you know, now I have a practice and I teach and research and, um, and for me, all of these things are not um, separate activities, but rather they really come together to reinforce um, inquiry and practice. And, and in, in the practice of landscape architecture, I think when you're doing both, when you're reflecting and asking big questions and also designing, um, we make the biggest impact. I'll, towards the end of the presentation, I'll share a little bit about my research on Olmsted because um, Senior, as he, he very much was engaged in multiple modes of inquiry and practice. And, and I believe that it is that tradition that, that is the mark of, of the profession. You know, if we accept that he was the father of the profession, that there are ways in which he was researching and practicing at the same time that, um, you know, are somewhat of a methodological proposition for how we as landscape architects and stewards of landscapes can be can be moving and operating in the world. Um, so I have a practice. We're seven people as of last week. <laughs> we made two hires last week. So we went from five to seven last week. Um, and we're on Lenox Avenue in Harlem, just steps away from, from Central Park where we often lunch. Um, the way that we talk about and think about our work is, is, is you know, taking big narratives, cultural narratives, ecological narratives, and moving that all the way through the dedication to a dedication of the craft of construction. So we don't have a construction details library. We really, you know, in every place that we work, really try to Think, be intentional about the way a material is expressed or two materials come together. Um, what is the quality of the space? What are the stories of the people? What is the feeling that this place embodies and evokes and how in a contemporary landscape can we amplify that? Um, that's, that's how we work. And, and so this methodology really allows us to work across scales, across project types and across geographies. So I'll share a sprinkling of a few projects and, and end with, with the research on Olmsted and, and tie it all together. Uh, this is a small streetscape project in Houston, Texas, um, in a neighborhood called Freedman's Town, where um, people who had formerly been enslaved, um, emancipated uh, right after emancipation, left the cotton fields of the Brazos River and settled in Houston. And they built this neighborhood called Freedman's Town. Um, they made their own bricks, they formed, you know, paved their own streets, they made their own institutions and homes and everything, all things that the city of Houston wasn't supporting. Um, and they cleared land on Buffalo Bayou uh, at a place on the bayou that was had very clayey soil, so it was prone to flooding, thick vegetation. Um, and it was because of these qualities uh, that it was, it was not developed, so given its proximity to downtown. So this is the spot that we're talking about. Um, and this neighborhood quickly became the civic heart of Black Houston, um, home to teachers and shop owners and lawyers and doctors. And um, it quickly fell victim to what many uh, urban you know, communities in the urban core of America's cities do, which is you know, bisecting the neighborhood with the freeway, a number of urban renewal projects, redlining, um, and more recently, the intense development pressure given its proximity to downtown. So I was working on a streetscape project on the street called Genesee. So on the left, you kind of see the quality of the historic grid and the right, the scale of the urban renewal that kind of peppers the neighborhood. Um, but there's some stormwater issues. And so we were commissioned, we were subs to a civil that was had to had the work of um, they've been commissioned by the city of Houston to upgrade the the, the drainage, and so um, you know they they told us I mean they expected us to do what they think landscape architects do, which is you know hey tell us where to put the trees right it's going to be street trees thirty foot on center where are the curb lines we're good to go, and 
you know, they were like, oh, maybe you could do like a plaque or something about the history, you know, or they were like, ooh, what about African pavers in the graph? And we were like, okay, look, we'll, we'll look into it. Um, we'll come up with something. And so, um, you know, I started by looking at the history of the architecture that the settlers built. So the bottom right is what the architecture, the historic architecture looks like. What I found is that the, the Yoruba, which is an ethnic group in West Africa, has an architectural antecedent. And when people were enslaved and trafficked from, the, from Africa to Haiti, they brought this architectural typology uh, during the Haitian Revolution in the late 18th century uh, and early 19th. They brought that type to New Orleans. And from there, it spread across the bayous of Southeast Texas. I wouldn't be surprised if it's in Louisville, actually. Um, but they're called shotgun homes. And um, the short end of the home, one, one of many distinct qualities of this typology is that the short end of the home faces the street, which means that each block has, kind of optimizes, maximizes the number of families and people that face one block. And it, so the street has an inherently sort of social life to it. And the ubiquity of the porch and the steps and the windows and doors and are all in alignment, there's a minimal setback, and this sort of, they come together to form this kind of gallery of spaces that are blurred between public and private, right? Between the private interior of the homes and the public nature of street. And when you talk to people from this neighborhood, their memories, their, their most complex and profound memories take place in this gallery of spaces. And so while some of these structures still exist, I went out and documented the, the patterns created by the stairs and the porches and the windows and doors. Um, and to even taking stock of the paving pattern that the original settlers laid. So the, you know, if you see along straight away, the, the pavers, the, the bricks are in a th orthogonal pattern. And then the intersections, they break to form a diagonal. And the elders in the neighborhood talk about how they did this, how the original settlers did this to mark this intersection as a space of ritual, and that that's a tradition also brought from West Africa. So for a little tiny streetscape project, I proposed concentrating the salvageable bricks in the intersections. And where this adjacent school asked for a site wall, um, instead of just a site wall, I proposed uh, a series of concrete panels, um, essentializing the, the these evocative Kind of patterns and essential dimensions of of the historic architecture um, you know and and the, the modesty of the material and the color aside from budget constraints really meant to speak to the modesty of the original structures themselves so here i am modeling the patterns created by the cutout doors and windows um, and i proposed actually forming the concrete with the wood panels from the structures as they continue to come down such that the panels are a grain of, of those original structures. And instead of site furnishings kind of off the shelf, the proposal was to integrate, you know, the porch motif into the walls so that they become a public offering of seating. And the planting palette itself is a way to tell a story about the Buffalo Bayou and the vegetation that the settlers worked to clear while also offering shade in the Houston heat. Um, and so, you know, what this project is about in a lot of ways is that, um, you know, every element of investment in the public realm is a way to tell a story. This is a streetscape project. It's a 60 foot right of way. But, you know, the stuff of landscape architecture, a road, I mean, y'all were just having a conversation about a lunar, you know, a road, a curb, the approach to drainage, the planting, the hardscapes, the site walls, the burn it, the seating, you know, the trash receptacles, like these are the media of landscape architecture. And we have the, the privilege and honor of, of being able to tell stories with every everything that we do. Um, this is a, a landscape, that we were commissioned to design for the Fairmount Park Conservancy in Philadelphia. Uh, Fairmount Park being the largest landscaped uh, park in North America. Um, and it's more of a park system. So I think it's a little bit of a loophole, but um, that's what they claim. So, um, so we were asked to look at this 22 acre portion of the park. What we learned was that historically there's a parks department and a recreation department in the city of Philadelphia. And the parks department generally was given 
jurisdiction of the interior of Fairmont Park closer to the Schuylkill River. And the rec department, and, and the parks department was historically white. And the rec department was historically black and generally given the jurisdiction of the edges of the park. And so you see here kind of the remnants of that with the concentration of amenities, of recreation amenities on the edges. And Reservoir Drive in between them was considered the boundary between black and white. It is still today. And um, the Conservancy had done a master plan which kind of focused investment in the interior of the park, the neighborhood was, wasn't happy about that. City Council stepped in and so forth. They said, we need to restart. And that was when we were, were brought in. Um, these are the existing conditions of the park. Uh, you wouldn't, just looking at the physical conditions, necessarily think that this was a notable, remarkable place. But when you talk to people here, this place, you know, this is a neighborhood, by the way, that whose high school is considered the most violent high school in America. It has significant um, unemployment. Uh, it's disinvested, lots of vacancy, a lot of it doesn't, a lot of issues. This park is a place for people to get away. It is, you know, we heard about so many important intergenerational relationships that formed here, you know, coaches with, you know, mentoring youth, the rec center being a place where, um, you know, people could get vocational training, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, just all the community support, first kisses, you know, everything had, this is the neighborhood's front park. And so we saw our job as elevating the physical conditions of the park to meet, to be in union with the significance of this place in people's lives. Um, one of the first things that we did, and we do this a lot, is to do archival work and finding really old images of this park really opened people up in a place where there's a lot of distrust uh, of planners and designers warranted, frankly. Um, you know, just starting with <laughs> these historic images opened people up to the process of, of being involved in, in, this, in this project. One of the community members gave us this poem. It says, now I have seen monuments, great geometric heaps of stone, lifeless towers raised to keep alive the dead. But I ask, cannot a monument that breathes be built? And this became kind of a creative departure for us about can a park be, can this park be the monument that breathes? Um, so we started our community engagement without anything drawn. Um, we, instead of a meeting, we, we actually hold ourselves to the rule of not ever having community meetings. We only have events. Um, this neighborhood has a lot of block parties. So we just had a block party to celebrate the park and the community as it is today. Um, so we had, you know, t-shirt making, I love Mander. We had hired caterers from the neighborhood. Um, we had rappers and poets come out and perform about what they love about the place and the park just the way it is. And it became also an, a site analysis tool for us to see ways in which the park would be activated. Um, and there were prompts around, you know, for people to share with us what they love about the park. Um, at a certain point, we switched out the barbecue for aerial maps and we had the 150 party goers break out into six large tables and they had to make a collective collage about what they love about Mander. Um, and so now instead of you know designer versus community member, we're just involved in the collage making. We're, you know, it's community member talking to community member trying to resolve you know, their priorities. Um, and so each of the groups sent a representative to the front and um, shared with us, and it gave us as the designers a chance to hear people articulate for themselves what was important. We took those six collages and did a sort of interpretive analysis of that. So not really a one-to-one -one kind of, you know, oh, there's a picture of bike parking here, therefore we need a bike, you know, bike parking there. But what are the big strokes? You know, what are the concentrations of activity and orientations? that led us to three design guidelines. One was activating 33rd Street, the sort of residential edge of the park. Second was bringing people into the heart of the campus. And third was creating a clear and legible uh, circulation system. And so we were, throughout the course of the project, you know, long story short, basically, we were able to communicate how the inputs from the collage making um, translated directly into the visioning shaping of a landscape plan. So um, 
we anchored to the Southeast. We said, okay, people, this is what people know that the Southeast corner is where people's lives are oriented and anchored now. We're gonna double down on that. We're, but at the same time, we're going to offer safe and accessible mid-block, we propose mid-block crossings. You can't make a loop around this circulation system without engaging reservoir drive. And so that's kind of how we resolve that issue is kind of both in. We wanted to reflect the fact that the sports fields are the center of the community. We shaped it in a way that makes it flexible for picnic, picnics and so forth. Garden walk that really brings people in from the north. Um, and really, you know, we worked with Digsa Architects to double the, the footprint of the recreation center. We created what we called a memory plan, um, which was, you know, as people shared their memories with us, that what we were proposing in the landscape plan, we wanted to make clear the ways in which it not only allows those things to continue, but it actually fortifies those memories uh, into in the existence in their existence into the future. Um, in a place where displacement is a concern, this became really helpful for people to understand how this change and this investment is actually anchoring them in place. John Coltrane grew up on 33rd Street facing the park, and on the left you see a sketch of the mathematics of jazz music that he did. And um, so we translated that sketch into a paving pattern that stretches across the, the course of the park. Um, and it became an armature for wayfinding and for inscriptions about notable people from the neighborhood. Uh, we heard a lot about family reunions. So we you know, developed this whole system of, of picnic groves. And um, you know, this rendering has a, a famous rapper, Meat Mill, from the neighborhood, which everybody in the neighborhood got a kick out of. Um, and then you know, in this sort of, Plaza, this this center, you know, not physical center, but social center of the park. Uh, we propose this water feature that you can see out into this sort of landscaped bowl, <laughs> this shaped bowl that holds the spectacle of community. Uh, and at the bottom of the water feature are the words of the poem about the breathing monument. So as you're looking out, you can really see the, goodness, um, the, the, the breathing monument that is. The you wanted your dance cell number. Um, like, okay. um, and then one more, I think this is the last project and then I'll switch to Olmstead Research, but um, this is another project that happens to be in, in Philadelphia called Graffiti Pier. Uh, this is a six acre waterfront park. Um, and it includes Pier 18 and Pier 20, which you can see is kind of falling into the river and a bit of the uplands area as well. Um, so we started this project like we do most projects, which is a lot of research. And we found this interesting um, fact, which is in the 1970s, when coal declined in the state of Pennsylvania, actually coincides with the moment that graffiti was invented, which was actually invented in Philadelphia. Um, and so this particular site, what that meant was that, uh, you know, this coal chute, when it fell into disuse in the 1970s, it, it arose into use by graffiti writers um, who are you know innovating this new this new street art medium um, and that was the case until 2010 when instagram happened and the site you know no longer became an underground street art museum it now became the most instagram spot in philadelphia that became a liability issue for the railroad company that owns the site and so they asked our client, the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation, if they wanted to consider, you know, making this a public park in some in some way. This, this is what the site looks like today. I mean, well, it looks different every day. Every day you go out there, it's a completely different um, landscape, but it's an incredible, beautiful place. You can imagine that the graffiti writers, when they heard about the idea of this being a becoming a public park, they were upset. Uh, because graffiti is a very sensitive ecosystem and it thrives on anonymity and, and transgression. And so our pitch to the client was, you know, while public engagement usually is meant to be very public, um, in this case, the constituents of this park are criminalized. They've been criminalized for their use of the site for 40 years. We want to be respectful of that. The fact that they have, you know, day jobs and government names and, you know, street art monikers. So we proposed to have a series of off the record conversations with them under freeway passes, at bars, 
Um, the client gave us a bar tab. <laughs> um, you know, we had representatives sent to us for graffiti writers that weren't even comfortable with that. Um, we got anonymous emails and phone calls. And, you know, among the things that we shared with them was that, you know, they, they were like, don't, don't touch it. Don't do anything. Do you have to do anything? What we shared in those initial conversations was the fact that if they were to do nothing within 30 years, oh, I thought my, that drawing was next, um, but I'll just tell you about it. Within 30 years, uh, the, the site will be inundated daily just from high tides. And not only from the, so not only is that pressure coming from the seaside, but from the land side, urban development is intensifying and encroaching quickly on, on the pier. And so it'll lose that sense of like being a place to get away from the city very soon. So without doing anything, you, you, you don't, you can't save graffiti pier. And so we decided to, this is one of the venues that we found ourselves in during these meetings. Um, we said, you know, you, you, this is your chance to save graffiti pier. We, we reframe the project as a save graffiti pier project. And that really mobilized them to get involved. Uh, this is the section I was going to talk about, but we, you know, we, we shared these with the graffiti writers and shared with them that this is a dynamic that this is happening and this is what you're up against. So let's do something about it while we can. Across these disparate conversations, we asked the same question. What is the best thing that can happen here? And what is the worst thing that can happen? And all of the best things kind of fall on the side of untouched and all of the worst things uh, kind of fall on the side of a new, new park. Um, and so we called out the emerging themes and um, we said, we said, if we can accomplish these four things that have are the most emergent, most common responses to the question, we've done our, we've done the right thing. Um, so that is one, ensuring the continuation and expansion of art. Second is keeping the site vegetated and passive. Third, making it safe and accessible without looking safe and accessible. And four is keeping it gritty. And so, you know, throughout the process then, we kept coming back to these four and we were able to communicate back how the four reinforced or re shaped, guided by, by those themes. You know, for instance, keeping it gritty, when we asked the graffiti writers, like, what does it mean to, to, what does gritty mean? Their response was, you know, rocks and, and water and vegetation. And, and, and it was very evocative of the intertidal landscape that, historically was here and that would be useful in, in, in view of the fact that the tides are rising. And so we proposed removing the bulkheads and introducing an intertidal landscape as a vegetative buffer so that the park can encroach upland and inland as the tides rise, but also serves as a visual buffer around Pier 18 as, you know, as the, also the development encroaches as well. And so this was the, the final, the, we just wrapped up concept design, the concept design phase. And so this is where we ended. Um, so it, throughout the process too, we, you know, for instance, we, we took some early renderings and brought it back to the graffiti writers and they actually tagged um, their feedback. And so we went through this process of decoding their graffiti tags as a, a way to re-engage our design. And we went back to the sections and incorporated, for instance, buyer attention swales, uh, and integrating that with the existing characteristics of the park. Um, we introduced a green frame uh, on the pier structure itself that traces where the pioneering plant species are, but introduces a more robust plant palette and really keeps the feeling of this place being like tucked away. When, when the pandemic hit and we couldn't hit, talk to people at bars and, and places anymore, we made a zine. The graffiti writers would go out to the, to the pier make art, take a picture, email it to us. And uh, we made a zine and in, were able to share the, the concept design updates as a collection of both their art as well as our, our proposed design. Uh, and so we actually mailed a few of them to a few people and had them then mail to their contacts and like spread out kind of through the web of networks that way. So, their input actually informed our design to the site furnishings as well. So we designed these large concrete slab looking, Jersey barrier looking um, furnishings that also offered additional surfaces for art making and really speak to the kind of material language of, of the site today. We looked at the archival drawings and found these, the beautiful 1923 
railings um, and the drawings of them rather. And we decided to incorporate them into new railings. So this is before and this is after. So these are new railings modeled after the, the original ones and brought up to code. Um, so I'll take you through a series of kind of before and after images. This is before and this is after. So it's upgraded surfacing to make it ADA accessible and the bioretention soil, again, just tracing where the pioneering species have emerged. This is before and this is after, same, same idea, upgraded surfacing, introducing a more robust, more resilient plant palette, um, but, but using those traces and really trying to recall the the, or, or keep, maintain rather the existing characteristics and charm of the site. So this is before, this is the east side of the trestle looking north in this kind of shady pocket. We're introducing a shade garden um, and our site furnishings as well. This is before and this is after more robust planting, some shade trees and our site furnishings. This is before, this is atop the, tr the trestle where people are already kind of climbing up. It's super dangerous. Um, and they said, look, whatever you do up there, do not make it the high line. <laughs> so um, that was our challenge. Um, so this is after we've introduced an ADA accessible ramp by cutting through the, the road, uh, the concrete bed, um, introduced the railings again, bringing it up to code. And then this, the planting, again, trying to not be high line about it, which uh, is just sedums and grasses and gravel, uh, keeping it kind of simple. And then on Pier 20, where the, the pier is currently falling into the river, we're proposing to shore it up structurally with our seawalls that are actually taller than the pier structure to introduce additional opportunities for art um, and also offer the opportunity for this art to engage in the, with the rising tides. Um, so this is after, the, and this is a space that's not currently occupied because it's it's of its structural condition. But here we are introducing the marsh planting and additional art walls. So um, it's a little bit about how we work and, and you can get a sense of how research and questioning and reflection propel the way that we're designing landscapes. And, um, and you know, given kind of my professional and personal trajectory, that's always been inherent to my work um, and what led me to landscape architecture. It was maybe only six, seven years ago that I first heard about Olmsted's travels in the South. Obviously, if you're, if you're interested in landscape, you know about Olmsted. But it's always kind of a footnote, if any, about his travels in the South. Um, and so I heard it in passing for the first time, 2014. And I, and I asked, started to ask people, can I read about, what can I read about Olmsted's the relationship between his travels in the South and his practice of landscape architecture. I found a little, not, not much. If that book had existed, I would have read the book and I would have continued on with my life and I probably wouldn't be invited here to have this conversation with you today. But that didn't happen. And so I started researching it myself and, and it's an ongoing work. I'm writing a book about it now and I'm trying to get it published by, by next year, by 2022. Um, so Olmsted, when he was 31, he was commissioned by the New York Daily Times, which is now the New York Times, to travel the slave states and write about the conditions of slavery. We all think the media is biased now, but in the mid-19th century, it's a lot worse. And the New York Times is actually established to write about this, what will look like was going to become a civil war uh, with an abolitionist stance. Uh, but they liked Olmsted for his writing about in, uh, in England, you know, his, the narrative quality, um, the expository details that he used, and the kind of objectiveness that he feigned to have in his writing. So I posit basically that uh, we haven't really historicized the legacy of his time in the South properly as a discipline in landscape architecture. I think it's much more, you know, the way we talk about it is like Olmsted used to be a journalist and he was an advocate, he was doing other things. And then he became a landscape architect. And I don't think that that's the right way to, 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 to understand his history or the, the forming of our profession. Olmsted, you know, so this is the kind of before, you know, this is how we think about his professional legacy. It's like, oh, he did the walks and talks and then he was a journalist and, 
Right. And then there's the landscape architecture part. Then he is appointed superintendent of Central Park and wins the competition. And then he owns that involves, you know, go across the North America and, and, and do all these great works. And then he retires. But if you look at the chronology of these things, he's actually going back and forth between his writing and, and researching and advocacy and his making of landscapes. So they're not actually even chronologically um, distinct periods of his life. They're, you, they're inextricable. And when you look at what was happening in the country at the time, uh, and, and you know, I, I had the privilege of spending four months at Dunbar and Oaks where I spent a lot of time with his personal letters and he's very much engaging in the, the most, you know, the, these notable historical moments and, um, and his work is reflective of, of the kind of challenges that reflecting on those things presented to him as a young man. Um, and so he writes for the New York Daily Times. He publishes them into a volume. He republishes them as a volume of three books. And then after his, I'll go back to the timeline. So, and then after um, he's overseeing construction at Central Park, he actually steps down from his role at Central Park. So this is January 22, 1861. He submits his resignation. Three weeks later, he begins to collaborate on a third publishing of of this writing on the South. Every time he publishes it, it's more and more staunchly abolitionist, less and less apologetic about the situation. And so he actually feels regret. He expresses regret in his personal letters about the degree to which he was apologetic about, about the issues. And he's just basically had it by the time he writes Cotton Kingdom. And he's like, we have to go to war. There's no saving. There's no, there's no loving people out of owning other humans. We can't, there's, we have to go to war. It's the only way. And so he rushes to repackage and rewrite his, his reflections before what he sees is a coming civil war. And so Cotton Kingdom is public like six weeks before the first shots fired at Fort Sumter. Um, this is just me and his personal letters. So, so he travels across the South. He actually makes this map um, by hand. And he's, what he's doing is he's um, trying to dispel the economic argument for slavery um, by showing that where the places where the largest concentrations of enslaved people are, the worse the economy is. Um, and that's kind of at the heart of his writing um, and and his and the definition of economy for him is not how many like how how many people have the most amount of money and he, he doesn't you know he doesn't challenge that he's like there are a few people that have a lot of money but even among white people enslaving people was is bad for them because it brings the wages down and so poverty among white people was actually worse in places where there's slavery this is an interesting quote by Charles Beveridge, who's you know, the foremost scholar in Onstead. He says, although Onstead changed in five, five years from a farmer to a writer and publisher, then to park designer and administrator, the single problem of slavery dominated his thinking and gave unity to his various activities. He comes back from the South and he's just like, okay, if we're gonna ask the South to be a, the same country as us, we have to be the best version of ourselves. And to him, that meant parks. He felt like the culture of slavery was so corrosive to civic life. Um, like he felt like in places where in, in, in Cotton Kingdom, he didn't see people investing in arts, in the museums, in public spaces, in civic life, that it was corrosive even to the people owning humans, that they couldn't see each other as humans. And so the, 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 for him, the, the weapon against that was, was investing in civic life and, and, and civic ground. This is, by the way, his itinerary. I, I, he did two trips, kind of three, but two real ones. Um, the first one being the, the Eastern seaboard and then he comes back. So you'll notice he stops in Louisville in 1853. Um, so I followed his Eastern seaboard trip, which was what he focuses on in the Cotton Kingdom language. And these are all just skim through a few images from my from my journeys, um, but this is supposed to be just a sneak peek, so you have to read the book to learn about all the stories. 
along the way, but there's a lot of stuff that happened that was really interesting. The big takeaway I'll say is that in a lot of these places, you know, the physical conditions that Olmsted witnessed weren't, are no longer there. But the social and economic dynamics that he speaks to are very, very the same. The things that happened to him, the, the dynamics that he describes, I went and this isn't the same thing. And so when, when you look at why or how those places physically are no longer the same, a lot of times it's landscape architecture that has recasted the history of these places, you know? And so it's an interesting kind of turn of events um, that this profession that he advocated for um, has become the weapon to untell the stories that he wanted to tell about this country. I'll just give you an example with this image up. Olmsted comes to this place in Savannah and he's describing an African burial ground. And I went here and I'm like, okay, I don't see this burial ground. Um, I see a beautiful park with a gazebo. And so the only place those people could be is below the ground. And so I spent the day asking people here, do you know that there's black people buried in this? Says, no, I grew up here. Did you know Olmsted came here? Oh, I know Olmsted, you mean the Central Park guy? Yeah. Well, yeah, he came here and he, he look, here are his words. He's describing his burial ground at this corner, you know, and it's true, they're there. Landscape architecture has come and recast it, right, this place. Um, this is us tracking down. This is, is just a journey. And I feel like, it, I don't know, I'm like, is it a movie? I don't know. It was a lot. It was a lot going on. But here we are, 2021, you know, practicing this profession that Olmsted um, you know, invented, as we like to say. And it begs a lot of questions about, about methods, um, about the role of landscape architecture in view of, you know, just as tumultuous as a time almost as, as when he was practicing. And so um, it, 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 the learning about this legacy has emboldened me in, in terms of what I think is possible for our profession. Um, I think there's a lot to build on if we really unpack um, unpack his 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 legacy even more than we already do and i think that's my time it is i have one minute i'll leave it there so sarah every time i feel like i have more questions and i'm just so um captivated by this idea and one thing that sort of struck me looking at this and hearing you talk about Olmsted, and I've read a lot of books about him and sort of this idea that you can create parks to sort of um, inspire people to be the best version of themselves. And you said, you know, using it as a weapon against sort of slavery in this corrosive and really toxic environment in the South and parks was this investment in civic life. Do you feel like that's still there with landscape architecture, sort of this movement to really push people to this idealized world and using it as a tool for democracy and all these sort of ideals that he had. I feel like often you see people who are trying, you know, like in Savannah to make a really beautiful space. It's interesting. Um, short answer, I, no, I don't think we're doing that. Like there was a boldness to Olmsted's mm -hmm. practice of landscape. Like if you, can you imagine proposing an 840 acre park, you know, in a major, major city, like in 2021, you can't, but there was a boldness and it, it was a different time, I understand. But, you know, uh, like, I don't know, keep going back to the lunar, like now for us, a street without curbs is bold, right? And, but like the, the idea that landscapes are significant enough to impact civic life. You know, it, if we are, if we believe that sincerely, I think the boldness is is on another level. You know, it's on the level of the parks that that we're working to just preserve today. But are we making new ones? Are you know what I mean? Not really. We're we're timid. And I think if you really do believe that landscapes have that potential, we would be investing in them. You know, in a different way. You know, Central Park in the last year has become a field hospital, you know, it's become a mental health sanctuary. It's an infrastructure and um, for survival, frankly, beyond, and in addition to everything else. And um, 
and but yet parks budgets, you know, the first ones get cut in a in a time like this. Um, and so no, I I don't I don't think we're doing that idea justice today. I think we need to be bigger and bolder. I mean, I think you know our parks in Louisville have seen the same as Central Park, like busier than ever. We've got one park that's been a site for vaccinations and you know testing and just the different utility of them. But sort of this idea that when Olmstead designed them, it was for mental and physical health, like in that time period, really focusing on that. They're for everyone. Um, and then this 2020 was like, oh, thank God. Yes, he was right. Like everything he advocated for is just as true today, if not more so, as it was in 1891 when he kind of came up with the idea here in Louisville. Um, it's really amazing. That it is also true. Yeah. Do we have, does anyone else have questions for Sarah? I know we've got some landscape art. Here's one I see that just popped up. Um, how can we make parks, which are geographically set, be better than separate but equal? Very good question. Um, you know, uh, the interesting, I, I just, I, I always go back to Central Park just because. I live next to it and I think about it all the time. Um, Central Park doesn't have a center, you know, and a lot of Olmstead parks don't have a center. There's no like everybody come together in this one place and be the same. Um, you know, a lot of his parks are about these disparate pieces of landscapes. So you can skate over here or you can have a picnic over here. You can do, you can do a lot of different things and be a lot of different people together. Um, and it, which was at the time, not the way parks in Europe, for instance, are being designed. It was all about like, where's the central promenade? Where's the, like, everything is very formal and leads to a center of power essentially. And so I see that as, as somewhat a reflective of his vision of democracy, which is we, we don't have to all be, you know, it's not about bringing everybody into one, like, thing but it is about being diverse it's but and being together and separate if that makes sense not separate in, in a way that holds us back but but separate in a way that allows anyone to be whoever they want to be you know in public space in the public sphere and so you know I always reflect on that when I'm in his parks because it's, you witness that we witness that people you know, even the same person can be diverse at different times of the day. I do so many different things in Central Park. I want to go by myself on a hike. I can do that there. If I want to be social with a bunch of people, I can do that there. And so that kind of variety and variation in life and in lives, um, I think there's a, there's a code for that if we look at his parks and, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very much a part of, of how I, you know, aim to practice and, and I think there's something to it. So I've got a question. I'm not uh, using the chat if that's okay. Please. Um, so Sarah, I have a question for you and that is um, a very interesting talk, by the way. So Speaking as, I mean, I'm, I'm a trustee of the Olmstead Conservancy here in Louisville. Um, and of course, our, one of our principal responsibilities is fundraising. So my question to you is, how, does, how do you think an, an organization like ours, and this is true of many kind of conservancy type organizations, how do we manage to keep true to, let's say, Olmstead's vision as you've just, let's say, expanded our understanding of it and yet and still not be seen as elitist, as somehow uh, too uh, restrictive um, in our um, in the way we deal with these issues. Any thoughts about how we can do that? Any thoughts about what you've seen in other organizations, for example, or how we might best apply these lessons? Yeah, I mean, you know, with our clients, um, I, you, which, you know, you saw a little bit about the way we work with our clients. That's often a concern, like the Fairmount Park Conservancy. Um, and so the method of engagement, the methods of engagement that we use are generally really crafted around like who is the community that this entity is trying to serve and reach and engage. 
a lot of times like the, these parks are actually serving a lot of people but then when it comes to actual organization you know planning and design and and the sort of institutional dimension they're not a part of that process but a lot of Olmsted's parks I don't know I don't know Louisville but a lot of Olmsted's parks if you go there it is people of color it is you know they're in the urban core generally and so there's a lot of urban communities like that use them the most um and so you know what we do is we really try to tap into the rhythms of the place of the social lives of the communities that are there so for instance for the Fairmont Park Conservancy this neighborhood had a lot of block parties so we had a block party you know graffiti writers what do they do they hang out in anonymity so we tapped into that you know another place we had worked with the boys and girls club that was outside of the neighborhood or outside of the park um right now we're doing a big park in for the city of pittsburgh and it's the football players that are all you know invested in it so we're going to football practice and talking to them about the lands the park you know it's it's a it for me it's you know i see it most successful when we're not asking people to step outside of their lives to engage but we tap in to what people are already doing there's very strong social networks on the ground how do we kind of like get into the tide that's already there and flow with it um, and it takes some creativity i think it's a design process in and of itself um, that's how we think about it is it has to be designed the process of engaging people has to is a design you know well, that's actually very encouraging. And I think Layla's got some statistics that she might share with you at some point about who our users are. But actually what you're describing about um, the efforts to engage people is really something we've begun to do very seriously. So I'm pleased that uh, what we're doing is right on, right in line with what you, did, you believe, for example, and others believe is a way to actually um, make sure we're on top of things. So that's encouraging. Layla, I think our numbers are what, 40? What, what's the percentage of um, um, of our local communities that are nearby our Olmstead parks? So we have about 40% are um, black, maybe another, you know, 5% uh, would be Hispanics or um, Asian Americans, depending on the park, um, which is, I think Louisville as a whole is about 20%. Black population wise. So, as you said, Sarah, like urban core, you know, these are the original parks. Um, and then about 40% have an annual household income of less than 25,000. So, also, you know, typically economically disadvantaged um, communities. Um, and I think the Victory Park story would be a, a good example of how the Conservancy is engaged with uh, a neighborhood to tap into what they what their requirements are and what their interests are. Right. I mean, I think part of it is just delivering on mm -hmm. it, you know, mm -hmm. talking to people and what do you want, and then turning around and raising money and building it. I mean, that was a huge success for Victory Park. And that's what they said. No one ever asked us what we wanted and then gave it to us. <laughs> like, you know, no businesses have invested there in decades and, um, so one question that Gina Dunlap had that uh, she's another trustee um, for us that was interesting, and this is something we kind of deal with a lot, sort of the impact and relationship um, between design and park management. Um, so what is the relative impact of design versus park management and oversight and how people utilize and experience public parks? Um, and what's been your experience or observations in New York with Central Park? Interesting. I mean, I mean, as a landscape architect, I admittedly have less involvement in management and oversight. Um, I'm more on the design and construction side. Um, but anecdotally and observationally, you know, it's clear that management, oversight, and maintenance have significant impacts on the people's relationship to parks. I mean, I guess that's somewhat obvious, but um, you know, when you signal that you care about a place. Through, it's through management and, and maintenance, people do too. And um, it's clear that, you know, in a lot of places in the urban core that that is sort of less the case. And so on a kind of high level, I'll offer that. But 
I'm I'm uh, less involved. I, I know much less about park management. I, I've never been involved in park management. Um, we, from the design side, definitely think about durability and think about how things will be stewarded after after us um, and advocate for the use of high quality materials and so forth, particularly in places where we think uh, people are less likely to invest over time and, and in places that are of high use. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't offer more than that because I'm, I'm really not involved in, in park management. Yes, um, Sarah, just to elaborate on my question, um, I thank you for this wonderful presentation. I've really been inspired by the um, examples and, and your interpretive abilities to translate, you know, history and legacy into, you know, a new and improved but respectful present. So when I talk about park management, I'm really thinking about people's ability to feel like they're in a welcome environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so not so much, you know, mowing the grass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, Central Park is iconic um, to, you know, at least from an American perspective, a lot of good things and bad things have been known to have happened in New York Central Park. And so I'm just looking for, you know, your specific perspective on what it feels like for you or what it may feel like for others to be in the park because that's an you know a, a huge component to you know getting the benefits that Olmstead intended. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a much funner uh, question than the one I thought. <laughs> you know, you never should have used the chat. You should have just started by that. <laughs> I like this better. Um, yeah, it's funny because you know I live on the north side of Central Park in Harlem, where just right outside of this window is where um, Central Park Five situation happens, claim allegedly happened. Mm -hmm. um, the scramble, you know, is where, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name now, but the bird watcher, no, uh, you know. And so, I mean, you know, the park is in America. So there is that, quite, you know, there is that. Um, I'll answer this in a way that probably isn't common in, in a way, and it, maybe I have, too much of a belief in this. But I, I do feel like design has can play a role in making people feel welcome. The actual physical space, you know? And, you know, whether, whether it's a welcoming gesture, whether it's open views, whether it's the materials, you know, that, you know, for instance, in the Graffiti Pier project where we're using like large expansive concrete slabs to do, to make seating, and asking for people to transgress and be themselves and participate in the culture that they've been practicing in. Like those small details and I think signal to people and, and, and in a way that necessarily they wouldn't be like, I feel welcome because of this way that a seat is designed. But mm -hmm. it is those small signals, small expressions of a place of the built environment that make you feel like you belong in it, you know? Um, and yeah, if we start to think about everything that we do, I mean, like the Genesee Street project and the walls and stuff, you know, I, I, as a landscape architect can't solve the real issue, which is the fact that that neighborhood is being removed. But um, I, I, I wield what I can towards making people feel like they exist, <laughs> you know, and that they exist, they, their stories happened and this, these are real lives and, and those implications of these histories are still are with us. Um, so I do, I, I feel like there's a, there's a, this long bench right outside my window and people just sit there all day, like all the dudes from the neighborhood are all on this bench hanging out all day. And that has, that's a question about the scale of the seating, its orientation, what are you looking at? You're looking at, you know what I mean? All of those things, like there's the reason why they're on this bench and not on the other one. And we just got to pull that apart and design with that lens, you know? Mm -hmm. I really think on a small scale sometimes about that. I feel like there's a lot of good people thinking about this at a large scale from a policy perspective, from a systems perspective, planning, you know, transit, but who is looking at the details? I always felt like, and this is a function of growing up in Louisiana and after Katrina, like all these well-meaning architects came and like built all this stuff. And I, 
I was like, wow, that's not, and I didn't know how to explain it, but I'm like, that's not what we were talking about. Um, because it's at a different scale. And um, that's where I feel like there's a lot of innovation and work to do. Does it, that's your question. Okay. <laughs> um, we have another question. Sarah, knowing every place and park is different, do you have a go-to favorite tree, shrub, or wildflower in your design palette? Hey, that's a tricky question. I love trees. Um, I love trees. I mean, I'm I'm from the south, you know, and so I love live oaks. I just can't help myself. And we actually don't have a lot of work in the south. A lot of our work is on the east coast. Um, but I want to put live oaks everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know less about shrubs and one, and honestly, like herbaceous plants. I'm, I'm a tree person more than anything else. But uh, there's people in my office who are obsessed with herbaceous, so that's where we pull our knowledge together. I love that question. Do we have any other questions for Sarah? Well, I will just um, close by saying, I think I thought your idea um, or your memory plan that you did at that one park was really, really good. I think so often, I mean, our inner city parks are really threatened by gentrification and there's sort of this balance of coming in and really redoing the park the neighborhood hasn't seen investment in a long time but how do you do that without encouraging gentrification um or without sort of erasing the culture and kind of history of people's memories that they've had in that park so i really really liked um some of those ideas that you did to kind of execute that component i thought that was fantastic well um it was great to, to meet you all and thanks again for everything you're doing for, for Louisville and I'll hope to be invited one day when the world yeah. opens up and see more of Kentucky. Yes, well, when you um, release your book next year, you will have to come for a book signing, book reading event here. We have a Kentucky Author Forum, which is a really big, um, great national sort of event. And so they always love bringing um, new book and new authors here, so. Great, I'll look forward to it. Yeah. Well, this is wonderful. Thank you so much to Sarah. And thanks to all of our members and all of you for being with us this evening. Um, we couldn't do what we do without you. So much appreciated. Great to see all your faces. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.